Welcome to Let's Chat, an athletic therapy roundtable. This is session 30 already. A uh, really special guest tonight. Before we get to that, let's do some uh, general ground rules as always. These sessions are being recorded for the purposes of saving the world one conversation at a time and being able to go back in time and hold Marcus accountable for all of his tips to hitting home runs and other things that we get into this evening. Um, if you have any questions, any comments, any concerns, please do so politely into the chat box or unmute yourself and it's becoming robotic now. Um, unmute yourself and just pop a question over uh, as you see fit. As always, this is open access. This is meant to grow our profession of athletic therapy by integrating athletes and other pra professionals um, into the conversation, growing awareness, growing networks, growing connections, and that's where we're at. So a really special guest tonight, again, session 30 of Let's Chat. Our guest this evening is Marcus Connect. Marcus grew up in Toronto and played youth baseball with the North York Baseball Association in Toronto. He represented the province of Ontario in the Canadian Championships, and then moving forward in the 20 third round, right? Is that right? I feel like that's right. In the, 20, so, yeah. Yeah, in the 23rd round uh, of the 2008 Major League Baseball draft, the Milwaukee Brewers selected Marcus, um, but he didn't sign. He opted to enroll at Oklahoma State University Stillwater to play college baseball for the Cowboys baseball team in the Big 12 Conference of the NCAA Division I. Uh, he received uh, 12 at bats in 2009, which prompted him to transfer to Connor State College in 2010. He was then drafted by the Blue Jays in the third round, 113th overall of the 2010 Major League Baseball draft. Um, and he made his professional debut in 2010 as well with the Auburn Double Days of the Class A short season New York Penn League. He was promoted to the Lansing Lugnuts of Class A Midwest League in 2011. And he was voted the Canadian Baseball Network Player of the Year in 2010 as well. Prior to the 2011 season, Baseball America named Connect the top power hitter in the Blue Jays organization. He played for the Dunedin Blue Jays in the Class A Advanced Florida State League in 2012. And after remaining with Dunedin in both 2013 and 2014, he was released in 2015. The Minnesota Twins then signed Marcus to a minor league contract, um, later to be released by that organization in 2016. 2016, he went on to play with the Quebec Capital of the Can-Am League. Uh, and he was, yeah, he was released in 2018 and then signed with the Toronto Maple Leafs in the Intercounty Baseball League. So a long and arduous path, but a baseball path nonetheless, and a greater one than I think anybody, well, definitely anybody in the room here. Um, Marcus, I'll let you say hi to everybody, and then we'll jump into some of the conversations as to your journey, your path, and, and some of your interactions along the way. Great, man. Yeah, hey, nice to see everybody. Nice to see your face, and uh, happy to be here. And I'm looking forward to, to talking. We'll see how long this goes. Try to keep it at a, at a, good, at a good pace. Let's <laughs> get it rolling. Yeah, no doubt about it, man. And I appreciate you tidying up, making that mustache look nice and tight for the evening affair and uh, the polo shirt. Not that you're not usually in a polo shirt, but looks nice, looks good on you. And I uh, really appreciate your time. Um, as always, Marcus, to have you on is, uh, is great. Um, to know you in this in this uh, in this world in this environment now, as opposed to where we met um, before. So, uh, just to give everybody a little bit of context, I met Marcus uh, through the Blue Jays when I was working in the Blue Jays organization. Um, he was drafted. Obviously, I was uh, I was working in the minor leagues. Uh, we actually kind of have similar paths. Actually, now that I read your bio again for the umpteenth time. Um, anyway, so Marcus was uh, yeah. was playing for Lansing, and I was the uh, the athletic therapist, athletic trainer for the Lansing Lugnuts during that season when you were called up, which was great. That's where we met, but you have uh, a lot of experience that goes a long way, man. And uh, let's start with sort of like your journey in minor baseball, um, where the passion came from, and then let's walk through your playing days. And as we go, I'll just pick uh, pick some points and just sort of interject with some stuff that uh, that might relate to some of our practitioner viewers um, as we go. So starting out in, yeah. uh, in in Toronto, man, North York, Bond Bond Park. Tell us a little bit about when you started, where you started, and and uh, how. Yeah, man. Heard you. Yeah. Well, yeah, man. Thanks for having me once again. Um, happy to be here. I'd love to talk about where I've been, where I grew up. I grew up at a in Bond Park. Basically, every day I'd go to the yard with my dad after school. He'd take me out. Probably 45 minutes before school ended. Most days, we'd go hit batting practice on the field. Probably got two or three guys, two or three kids on the team, and, and we'd hit every day. And um, that's where I spent the first eight years of my career, age six to 14, pretty much with my dad, um, hitting, trying, just trying to hit bombs, basically, trying to hit home <laughs> runs, trying to, hit, trying to swing hard and, and just focus up and 
you know, we had, we always had, had competitions, you know, see how many home runs I could hit that day and then we'd count them. Um, so I, I guess I had a drive. Um, it really helped me bond with my, with my old man as well. I look back and I realized that was, you know, that was some of the best times is spending that time with my dad and having them, having a shared goal to, you know, become, become, just have fun really. Yeah. You know, have fun yeah. and, and just, um, I guess, advance my career because that was something that just stuck out to them as something that I wanted to do. Ever since you know, the Blue Jays won the World Series, 92, 93, my mom always tells a story that I would stay up during the playoffs, during the, the World Series, I would stay up to watch the whole game. As like a two or three-year-old kid, <laughs> I'd stay up until midnight. <laughs> I'd know the whole lineup. I'd know the players, you know, I'd have the jersey, I'd have the hat. I was all Blue Jays all the way. So I would say that what, what propelled me and my love for the game was definitely the, the Blue Jays making it and that whole atmosphere and uh, the, the amazing time those, those two years. Yeah, uh, amazing definitely. stuff. And, and, and so, like, you were young at that time, so you probably didn't register it now. But, but looking back, like, do you remember sort of, like, what, uh, when the passion really uh, kicked in for you and you were like, man, I'm going to do this forever? Or was that kind of like always sort of innate to you? Um, well, it's, it always starts off as fun, right? It always starts off as you, you want to just, you want to play ball. But um, there's actually, there's one part uh, of my career, my young career that, that really, you know, gave me the edge and uh, it was something called the, the Honda hit, run, and throw competition, mm -hmm. where it's basically hit, run, hitting, running, and throwing, right? Trying to hit as far and straight as possible. Try to run as fast as you can around the bases and then try to throw as long and straight as possible, right? And they just measure it with a tape measure. And uh, they had, the, the competition was at the very top. It was a national competition at the Rogers Center. That was the kind of like, the prize you want to be. You want to represent Ontario. You want to represent your, your province and join together and try to win that. So it started at a local level, then it went regional, provincial, and then national. So you had to win four different um, heats, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I did that for three years. I did that competition for three years. I lost the first, well, I lost, you know, I, 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 um, I didn't move on the last, the first two years and you know, over those two years, my parents and I put together a pretty sweet plan, you know, where we studied the competition from the guys the year before, studied the competition of the, everybody in, in other provinces. Yeah. Right? And then we devised a plan to get together um, every day. And we trained hit, hitting, running and throwing, basically just getting a tape measure out. And I go out with my mom and dad and, and we, we just try to best our score from the day before. A little right, bit better so every day, man. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So we set. I mean, we study the competition. It's something I talk about with my, you know, with parents that of the kids that I, I train now is that we um, we study the competition, so we knew what you know what to, the the mark was, the top mark. We knew what the best were doing, and then once we knew what the best were doing, once we had those metrics, we simply focused on what I did the the day before, and we focused on you know how I was yesterday and how I can best that today. Hmm. So that's kind of like looking back at it and talking with my parents about that process. Um, oh yeah. So then I didn't finish the story there. I ended up winning the, the national, the third year I did it was the year I ended up winning the national, um, the hit run and throw champ. I won the gold medal as of the hit run and throw. And that was like, I felt like a big shot there, but it, <laughs> really, helped me. it really helped me. Yeah. But it really helped me understand that. You can buy the plan to achieve that goal and you can, really, you can really achieve, you know, anything. And that's kind of like the first time where I actually put that in action. And, um, and plus the training of just doing that actually set me well above my peers in a major way. And I threw harder than, by the end of it, I threw harder than everybody else. I hit the ball farther than anybody else, and I was a fast runner. So, I mean, not only did it help me mentally, I mean, it helped me advance my physical um, to the next level as well. So, yeah, I said that, that yeah. definitely propelled me 
and, and gave me the confidence and um, and the plan and and uh, the support to to take it to the next level for sure. So so how old were you when you won that competition? I was in grade six. Yeah. So twelve. Okay. Awesome. It's awesome because yeah. we talk about this, you know, we talk about it all the time when, when we're on here talking with either, you know, pro trainers, pro strength people, uh, medical doctors, whoever's on here as guests, it's sort of this common thread of like where we can impact the amateur sport. And I want to go there with you because I know you're doing some coaching now, um, which we'll get into as well. Mm-hmm. But um, first of all, was there like VHS at that time? Do you have like a big VHS video <laughs> of you winning that or no? Uh, we got, I guarantee there is my, my parents, my mom and my, my dad, they, they filmed a lot of things. So yeah. we got to look through the, all, all the records, but there's gotta be, I know we got pictures. Yeah. We got pictures. So, um, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. We'll send, send, send those over. Media. Yeah. Yeah. Send, send yeah, some of that media over. Them. We'll make sure that gets up on social. Cause that's, uh, I'm no sure doubt, at, yeah. at 12, at 12, you look like, uh, um, uh, well, like a miniature version of what you look like now, I guess. But um, it, it's interesting because you talk about the elements of fun and that's kind of what initiates, you know, sport for most players, most athletes, most human beings is you, you, you engage because it's fun. But really, in listening to you speak and in knowing you a little bit as well, um, the element of competition is fun for you as well, right? So, so they're not really separate. They're kind of bred together in, in your circumstances, right? Is that fair? Is that a fair assessment? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think it's just it's built, it's built within us to want to, wanna, you know, see what others' best are and, and try, to, try to beat others' best. I mean, I'd say that's, that's natural. Yeah. You know, as you get higher level, you, you know, you, you got to kind of, I learned you have to kind of switch the competition to more of competition with yourself at the very highest level. And then the competition, the nature of it changes, but you know, competing to win a championship with a team is definitely the, the, the motivational factor, the driving factor to, to playing and wanting to get better. Right. You want to do good for your team. Absolutely, man. Being a part of something that's bigger than you, but at the same time, knowing that you have to better yourself every day. These are key points in life. These are key points in success. And, and uh, you and I have had some conversations of late and, and potentially doing some work together in the future, I hope, well, right along those lines, which again, we, we'll get into as we get a little bit further along in this conversation. This is like, uh, you know, first date, we don't want to get going too quickly here. Um, but the, yeah, those elements of, of competition and, and fun and also besting yesterday, like those are massive things. And and we read through your bio and, and you're a high draft pick and there's a lot of expectation and um, on yourself, I'm sure, but from others as well. You know, you hear the media reports, you get into an organization and you're the kid who was drafted at, at a really high level and, and you're going to sit there and you're going to be held to a higher standard and all these things that happen. How did that wear on you at the time? Like, let's go back to like your draft, the second time you were drafted. Um, you remember like where you were and how that happened and then and then... Once it happened, where did your mindset go? I guess that's kind of let's go there. But before the draft, yeah, like when you were about about on draft day, where were you, and and how did that go down? On draft day, I was uh, I was at my family at my mom and dad's place. I was nineteen years old, and I had a couple of my closest friends over, Um, and you know, we were just waiting. We're watching the names get called. Names get called. And I didn't end up getting picked the first night, you know, which was disappointing. I thought I was going to get picked and I had all my car planned out and I, I knew what car I wanted to get and all that stuff. Right. <laughs> but uh, it didn't happen that way. And I ended up getting drafted the next, the next morning. So, um, I mean, leading up to the draft, it was, it was the second time I've done it right in high school. I had, I had some attention and this time, um, it was, I didn't feel much pressure, honest. I, I didn't feel, or maybe I handled it well, right? I handled it well. I just kind of did my, went about my business. And, um, you know, we had a team. Our team was amazing. You know, we were ranked first in the nation for, you know, five or six weeks. And we had a chance to play for, you know, play for a championship. So um, that's that's what I kind of valued more than, than the draft. And, um I enjoyed the eyes. That's for sure. I mean, I enjoyed doing well for my team and uh, it was really the first time I put in a bunch of work. Like I, I get developed a routine every night uh, with a couple friends and we trained every night and um, we really got into a good headspace. I had some really good teammates and 
you know, they really helped me, you know, push, push me along as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. It's, it's, it's amazing to sit like, uh, I mean, sit in a room. I feel like we're in a room together, but we have been in a room together. So I can assume what that's yeah. like. Um, but to sit in a room and sort of listen to somebody who's been through that experience and, and just as, as driven and as humble and as successful as you are and have been, um, to, to reflect on it and, and see like at the time now looking back how it feels different or if it feels different or, or what might have been um, what you might have done differently. It doesn't really help in looking back. But at the same time, um, I just kind of want to go down the space of did you feel like a lot of expectation at the time or did you feel like I earned this, I deserve this, I'm ready to go? H- how did it feel at the time when you were at that, um, you know, drafted that high and, and all of that that surrounded it? Well, um, well, I, I was reading, you know, I got caught up reading all the draft reports and, um, my parents were interested. They're helping me. I didn't have an advisor. Uh, so it was just really the family, you know, reading reports and reading scouting reports on me. And, you know, there were some reports that said I was going to get drafted in the even higher. Right. So as soon as you see that, you automatically set your expectations. Mm-hmm. to the highest you see other people have seen you right so uh, my expectations were very high going into the draft and I was kind of actually disappointed that I was drafted where I was which is I know it's crazy but um, that's just what expectations can do right you, you put in a good situation but if you expect more you know you might not appreciate where you are now right so yeah yeah, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great point. And to have that experience and, and to hear, you know, to hear somebody who's been through that level um, of, of understanding and, and just appreciating, you know, what expectation can do, but also what your, where your drive and where your, your talents can take you as well. So it's, it's awesome to hear you just even touch on that. And, uh, and then to get drafted by your hometown team. So like you're at Bond Park and now you're just going to hit the DVP, head a little bit south and then take the lake shore of the garden yeah. over the dome and you'll be there. Uh, yeah. No problem. So, um, yeah. you, you spent, you spent some time in the Blue Jays organization. You had some great teammates. You had uh, a pretty average trainer in Lansing and, uh, and some other people along the way. So, um, in, your career um injuries uh training what what changed when you shifted sort of from let's call it amateur let's call like you know pre pre pre-college college college, and then from college to to being in a major league organization what shifted um in terms of workload and in terms of support or did anything change oh the support the support changed dramatically i mean we had I i was with you the first, my first full season, which uh, I ended up seeing you quite a bit the first couple months. I remember we were in the training room quite a bit and you were really helping me out. Uh, I had something going on with my foot. I don't know if you, uh, if you recall, but every time I woke up in the morning, I had this unbelievable pain, pains in both my feet. And uh, it hasn't happened since, but I guess it helped me develop a routine in the training room a bit. And I got to know you. And maybe that's why we're here now. Who knows, right? Um, <laughs> but I developed a, a pretty good routine in the training room using the hot tub and the cold tub. I got to know the ice bath. Uh, there's a lot more support definitely in, in professional baseball than there is uh, anywhere else. So uh, workload-wise, was heavy, heavy workload. On, you're just on your feet all day. Yep. You know, you, and you spend an off-season. I, sp- I love working out, so – it was tough for me to wake up and not feel like doing anything except just go to the field and hang out and uh, get my stuff done and go play. I didn't want to work out because I felt tired. But that's part of the grind, I guess. That's that's the physical grind of, of baseball. Yeah, you know? yeah, it, and and it's interesting for people who haven't been in it or or for people who who think that they're familiar with it or or maybe even are familiar with it. Once you're in it, it's it's not easy and it's not just showing up and playing a bunch of baseball games every day. It's uh it's all the work that goes in on a daily basis to sort of prepare yourself, prepare the team, prepare everything that needs to be prepared on a day to day um with today's tonight's game at the forefront, but ultimately, you know, down the road is kind of what you're preparing for, right? So you kind of have this dual stage of preparation for not only today, um, but also how you're setting yourself up for the future, which is kind of this, this strange dynamic, 
right? And and, and how you house it on the day to day does affect long term. But if if there is no long term goal, you're kind of pooched as well. If you're only just sort of setting up for how I'm going to do today or situationally. So an interesting kind of life. And you, and you talk about being on your feet all day. Yeah. Um, and just had a, a, um, a colleague and friend and, and a mentor on here last week, uh, who's with the angels organization in the performance realm. And we were talking about fatigue, you know, and I think one thing in looking back that didn't really get a lot of attention was the level of fatigue on minor league players because the sleep isn't great the hotels aren't great you're on buses you're not on five-star hotels and you're not in jets um you're not changing time zones necessarily but the food definitely wasn't great you know we had john birdie on here who you know from your time in the blue jays organization as well and and uh and he was talking about yeah. you know we you were just kind of at that end point where the food started becoming a bit of an issue or, or a bit of a um, a focus point for organizations but the fatigue factor is massive in baseball right because I mean like you're coming in on a day-to-day -day and you're, it's groundhog day every every day I feel like you're so well set up for COVID just because you've been in minor league baseball you know you could just hit repeat and, and you're, you're, okay, you're okay with the same thing every day but um, maybe just walk us yeah. through sort of uh, sort of what uh, you know what Auburn was like and what Lansing was like and Florida State League like these are let's say low level but I mean they're low level professional states and, and not yeah. to minimize what you've done and, and where you got to I mean so, so more context on Marcus is, is over his eight years in professional sports in, in all areas I think the, the best stat that I got um, stat line that I got showed 72 professional home runs you know 439 RBIs 71 stolen bases and and uh, you know the better part of uh, uh, nearly 800 hits in a professional career so n nobody can say that definitely on this call there's not a lot of people that can say they've achieved all the things that you've achieved um, but those minor league levels they're tough to prepare in right like there's there's sometimes there's nobody there I mean Lansing was pretty good nice stadium but Florida State League it's hot as can be and there's oh, yeah. not, not really anybody there so maybe just walk us through um, uh, life in the minor leagues however you want to sort of summarize that and then we'll get into some other things yeah okay well my first year in the minor leagues was amazing um, in terms of just the crowds and I mean I came from a small junior college in Oklahoma with you know 1200 people in the, in the whole town right so when I came when I came to Auburn was, we didn't have that many fans but it was just amazing to be playing in front of a crowd that you know, pays to watch you play and they know your name. You go to the, you know, the grocery store and you have somebody, you know, getting you some lunch and wanting to talk baseball with you and knowing your name and knowing your stats and all that stuff. <laughs> I, I found that very, I th found that, uh, I found that awesome. Yeah. I liked mingling with the fans and meeting them outside the field. Um, Lansing was, you know, amazing place. I had a great year there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had a great year. That was, that was probably my best year statistically. I started the year hot. You know, I showed my best, my best talent, you know, right off the bat. Um, and um, I had a rough patch halfway through the year, you know, where in terms of like mentally, uh, I started struggling at the plate. I developed, you know, something, something new in my swing. And, um, I tried to fix it with more swings and, and more effort and more effort and more effort, not really understanding what was, what was going on. Right. I've always just, you know, wanted to stack more on top of more when it came to trying to fix something, right. More swings in baseball. It's more of a skill that doesn't, doesn't always require more swings or more effort. Uh, so I finished that second year pretty, pretty down in the dumps, man, honestly. And, uh, you know, considering I started so well and, you know, as a young player, didn't really know what, what it meant to, to develop a successful routine. Didn't know what to do when I failed, when I, or, or when I um, hit a roadblock. And um, I, the next year I went to, uh, I went to Dunedin and I spent the next three years there. You know, I was still like, I consider my time in the minor leagues, I thought it was I, it, it was hard, man. It was really difficult. You know, I, I feel like baseball is supposed to be, um, you know, the, a physical grind. I knew that, right? It's supposed to be the physical grind, and I was okay with that. I was, you know, I love putting in the work and spending time with, 
um, with other like-minded baseball players. But the, the mental grind for me was, you know, I didn't know how to get out of, get out of slumps. I didn't know, you know, nothing really resonated with me and help and help me get out. Instead, I just kept, you know, falling into the same traps over and over and over. Mm-hmm. And it was difficult, man. It was, it was well, I spent the next three years in, in Florida, which is like scorching heat, no fans. And uh, it, was, it wasn't that enjoyable, you know. It wasn't that enjoyable for me on the field. Some days, obviously, it was. Some days are amazing. Everything goes right. And, you, you know, you, you love the game, and the game loves you back, and you feel <laughs> like it's all good. Yeah. You know, and then, and then all of a sudden you start thinking you're too good, Right, you start like you know you're standing on second base or something, and uh, you you know you think I figured it out, and then that's the moment where you know three games later you have no idea where you're at again. You're you know the bottom fell, you know from under you. Yeah, that's what happens to a lot of hitters, man. And that's what I went that's what I went through time and time again. Um, and for me, I didn't you know I didn't really realize it until until about two years ago of what, you know, what it actually took to, to get into that state of mind. It's, it, I realized that it's, it's a mental, it's a mental game, you know, like the mental controls the physical. And if your mind's not right, you know, your movements aren't going to be right. They're going to be jagged and, and rigid and jumpy and you're going to interfere with your natural movement. And um, it's not something, you know, until, you know, I don't want to say until it's too late, but it's not something you know in, until you step out of the thing that you've been in for so long, right? So, um, so I that's now why I teach hitters. That's now I, I kind of I go through my story. Uh, I, I tell them what I went through, and and we develop a solution that helps them get outside of the way they're thinking and uh, develop a process, a system to really get to that place in your mind, which is basically empty, empty your mind and, and track the ball, let your body movements just follow the ball. Yeah. It can be that simple, man. It can be that simple if you it, let it. it. It can be that simple. And, and, and when it's that simple, it's also so complex, right? So, so you talk about some things that are really, really interesting and really near and dear to sort of uh, some of the philosophies and some of uh, – um, the approach that I'm taking to performance and to wellness. And I've shared a little bit of this with you and some of the yeah. practitioners on here as well. And, and it's amazing how, uh, how parallel our process is right now in terms of, uh, of, of your approach to hitting and teaching and, and sort of the way that I'm sort of leaning and skewing my pathway to, um, to performance enhancement uh, uh, naturally and, um, and, and overall wellness and sort of molding those together. So you talk about, um, yeah, when you're going good, everything's great. But when you get two up, it's like, a, who was it? I can't remember who it was, but somebody said it's just like, it's a daily serving of humble pie playing baseball. You know what I mean? Like you get too high, you get yeah. knocked right back down. You get too low, you're just going to either stay there or just get knocked even lower. And uh, you knew Sal Fasano, who's a, a great longtime, you know, longtime catcher in the big leagues, backup guy and manager in the minor leagues and assistant coach, bench coach with Atlanta last time I checked. And I, I had him as a, or he was a manager when I was in Lansing. And, and he always just said, no matter how good or how bad it was going, he would just walk into the clubhouse and just say, stay humble. That's it. And then just walk right through the clubhouse. And like this big giant beast of a man would just walk through and just say, stay humble. And that was it. Just like two grumbly words. Um, but you're exactly right, man. Cause the mental yeah. controls the physical, but the physical can also drive the mental. Cause if it's going really, really well physically, your mindset is now like, ah, I got this all figured out. And then something changes. Like it's sort of this, this sort of like wooey space. And you talk about being empty and uh, I always liken this to, to physical motion as well. Right. It's like if, if, if you don't know, uh, well, first of all, you don't know what you don't know. So you've touched on, um, you know, not being able to, to capture this until a couple years ago. But when you're fully immersed in it and you're being told on a daily basis, oh, it's physical, it's physical, it's physical, it's physical, let's change this, let's change this. Oh, you're dipping. Oh, your back foot's not coming off the ground. And it's, and it's you know, uh, external cues. The, the internal cues get left out. And the internal cues sometimes are, are maybe 
may be more important than the external cues, right? Like those mental approaches. So you had a couple great mentors, uh, uh, great mentors, great, great hitting coaches that started approaching that in the Jays organization, right? Like, uh, um, I don't know if you want to talk about, about spring and, and post and, and those guys, they started, I, I was privy to a couple conversations they had and some of their presentations that they made, um, but not to belabor what they were doing more to get into what you're doing now. So now you're working with amateur athletes, you're sharing your story and, uh, and, and addressing the mental side of the game, right? So what age levels are you working with right now? And, and where, do you think, um, where do you think that can benefit um, uh, amateur level athletes? Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, I heard from somebody who's been, in, like, uh, who's been in amateur baseball for 30, 40 years, said baseball starts from the bottom up. And I took that to heart. Right. It starts from the bottom up. It's the same with a, a, a um, professional organization. You know, a good farm system breeds a, a good major league system. And I, so I approach that the same way as, as amateur baseball. So I, I like to work with, uh, like I work with an eight, eight and under team this morning, you know, rookie ball, eight U. And we had fun, played some games. And, you know, I, I do like mostly vision. No, there's no mental stuff. You know, it's more like stealth, stealth mental, right? Where yeah, you yeah. get them focused on, yeah. on the target coming at you and, and they, you get them tracking the target and all of a sudden, all of a sudden they're hitting, right? And then you play a game and all of a sudden they're having fun and then they don't even know it and they're getting better, right? So it's more like stealth, stealth type of training. Um, and it, that even works, that even works all the way up to professional, man. You, you do stealth, stealth mental training where you just get them focused, you know, do different challenges, give them different cues, um, but that ultimately get them focused on the highest priority, which is, you know, which is tracking the ball with 100% clarity. And when they do that, their, their body responds, you know, all the way. It's a, baseball is a kid's game, so, it, you know, what works with an 8-year-old would work with a 38-year-old. That's the beauty of it. So hmm. um, <laughs> uh, you can approach the same – you can approach that aspect the same way. You're still tracking a target. Your physical response, uh, depending on how clear the target is. So that means that, like, when I look at mental, I look at I look at visual, and they're so tightly uh, entwined that, you know, there, to me there really is no difference. Um, so, you know, just continually get them finding ways to get them focused on on ultimately the ball, and um, and with the more advanced players who are willing to let go of what they know. Uh, and focus on a process that helps them see the ball uh, the best they possibly can. You know, we got a couple guys on that program, a couple college athletes, and uh, and they do really well. You know, they, they stay calm in situations, um, all situations, and you know, they're doing really well right now. So, it, like I said, it's it's the same, man. It's the same with an eight-year-old. I do the same things an eight-year-old as I do with a – with a 25 year old, 28 year old, I just try to make it sound a little cooler to, to the older guys, you know, but yeah. it's, it's a beautiful thing how, how it works the same way. Yeah. You got it. You kind of got it. That's an amazing analogy, you know, and, and I think that goes the same for, uh, for all of us, you know, as practitioners in the field, we sometimes get so caught up in what's trendy or like, what is, uh, what's the latest, I don't know. I don't want to make a mockery of it, but like, what's the latest evaluative technique for the shoulder? Or what's the greatest screening model to know if an athlete's going to get hurt or not? And, uh, and, and we neglect the foundational components that are relevant to us on a daily basis, no matter who we're talking to. And we sometimes just get so, yeah. ah, it's like pimping your ride. You know what I mean? Yeah, you, you kind of got to pimp your ride a little bit as you get older. You got to make it look a little flashy or make it sound a little flashier. But it's awesome to hear you yeah. say, like, you know, you're doing stuff with eight-year-olds on the sly. And, like, I love that stealth. That's awesome. Because I was working with, um, I was doing the same thing. I got lucky enough to coach some kids and, and uh, work with them a couple times a week. And they're like, oh, man, like, sorry, but we have it built in. You have to do 30 minutes of warm-up. And I was like, 30 minutes of warm-up? This whole thing should be like, why are we calling it warm-up still? Let's call it like movement preparation. And so on my end, it's like, it's yeah. completely evaluative. Like I'm evaluating, you know, capacity to understand, capacity to, to move, capacity to understand verbal cues or do you need a visual cue? Obviously no tactile cues right now because we can't be within that, uh, that space. But, uh, you know, 
and then we can understand, can you stand on one leg? Can you stand on two legs? Do you understand when I say right and left? Do you understand when I say rotate? What does that mean to you? Because if rotate, when I say rotate, you do this or you yeah. just rotate. Yeah. So that's really amazing um, that A, those eight-year-olds have access to you. And then B, you're able to share all of this wisdom and knowledge and, and express the components of the mental side um, for, for athletes that are so often, uh, that area is so often overlooked and are so physicalized in sport. Right. Like we and this is exactly it. You've talked about it in, in performance on the field. I'm addressing performance and wellness off the field with athletes and practitioners alike to say, hey, like, let's slow down. And this all doesn't have to happen with physical stuff, because when we cue in the mental side and we can access a little bit more of you, Marcus Connect then you're going to be better when you leave the room. And when you go out on the field, you're going to be able to perform better because you have more access to, to what you actually have the capacity to do. So it's amazing. We're on so many parallel levels right now that uh, I, I can't wait to, to, to kind of keep talking about this stuff as we go. So it's great. Yes, it's, fan it, it, it's fantastic. Um, uh, so, so your career was long. I mean, you played baseball since you were six years old. And now if I do the math, you're, you're not six years old anymore. So it was a long time. There's a lot of home runs. There's a lot of hits and, and running and throwing and all these things. Um, injuries along the way, you talked about your feet. Um, you talked about the fatigue, which I honestly consider probably in baseball, like uh, an injury, right? Like that's an injury. Fatigue is an injury and it's, it, it's, uh, it's, um, it's sustained over time, but that's something that needs to be addressed on a daily basis as part of maintenance and as part of sort of controlling what we can to deter further injury from happening. But were there other injuries along your, yeah. along your career that, uh, that sort of slowed you down? Was there anything that, that, uh, trainers or strength coaches gave you that really sat with you and, and helped you along the way? Oh man. Yeah. Like I fell in love with, with strength and conditioning because of, you know, the, the strength and conditioning coaches that I had in professional baseball, you know, they motivated me beyond that. They're like, I consider them my mentors just as much as, you know, any coach. Um, you know, I learned more from trainers and, and conditioning coaches than I did any, any uh, I mean, you know, probably anybody else to be honest in, in pro ball. Um, but yeah, man, I had some injuries. Dude. I had some injuries. In twenty uh, twenty fourteen, twenty fourteen, I, you know, I hurt my back. I hurt my back for sure. Deadlifting. Um, you know, I, was, I usually do heavy heavy Mondays deadlifting. Heavy Mondays. That's what I did in the off season, and I was you know, really really dehydrated from one of the weekends you know that I spent in Toronto. And I decided to do heavy deadlifts. And uh, I'm sure this was just a compound effect of just the same routine over and over. But I uh, pulled my back. It turned out to be, it turned out to be like a, like a, like a SI joint. Okay. Sacroiliac, right? That's, that was the diagnosis. And the next day I actually went to, I was on a flight to Australia. Figure that one out, eh? Yeah, that'd be a tough one. I pulled but that kept, you know, that kept popping back up, or you know, over the years, you know, where I'd, where I ended up, it becoming, it became easier and easier for me to, for that to happen, mm -hmm. right? Where I'd go to do a, like a, a session of hot yoga, right, and I'd do the, the wrong class, or I'd try to stretch too much, and wake up, but I couldn't get out of bed, kind of thing, right? And um, my hips got messed up. I didn't really get the right treatment. You know, I neglected it. And um, started feeling pains otherwhere, uh, elsewhere, you know. So like, yeah, I think the, the that injury was was pretty su pretty substantial. I'd say in the long run, over time, right? Because it mm -hmm. compounds. <laughs> then your body has to. It's always going to operate around the goal, right? So it's when I'm just taking swings, I'm still aiming to hit the target hard. But if it's if I'm not moving properly, then it's just going to find another way my body's going to find another way to move in order to get there as efficient as possible. Yeah. And yeah. you know, if you just pound that pattern back and over and over and over and over, you know, you're creating suboptimal patterns and you can't even feel it because your body's so, so good at adapting, right? You can't even really feel it and you only really know over time. So I think my swing, my swing was definitely affected. My natural swing was affected by 
by that and then by taking, you know, high reps, high velocity, high power movements and continuing my regular schedule. So, I mean, it's something that, something I talked to all my older guys about is definitely that the health is wealth. And that if you got something, if you got something, get it treated and work your tail off to get it better than it was before, or else it's going to affect your swing. We all know baseball players, they treat their swing as if it was, you know, it was gold because mm-hmm. it is it's the natural swing. Right. And I mean, if they knew, if they knew how much that could possibly affect their swing, then they would, you know, how important it was. And they would get right into the gym and get to the training table and do what they had to do to, to fix that. Cause it's going to affect them down the road and they're not even going to know why. And it's going to, that's what's going to get them. They're going to wonder why they're missing pitches now yeah. and things like that. Why they're not playing as well as they you know they're capable, things like that. So yeah, for me, that's, I had a couple injuries and um, I didn't take care of them as well as I'd like, but that's my story, man. Yeah. So that's, and that's, that's the story that, that I tell my guys and I consider it, uh, I, I consider it, you know, a great opportunity to let them know firsthand experience yeah. of what could happen if they, if they don't take it, if they don't take injuries seriously. So. Yeah, and and, and you br- you bring up so many uh, so many great points for practitioners as well. And I'm just listening, and I'm and I'm writing down notes as we go, and just kind of like making mental notes to myself in terms of you know working with athletes. Sometimes we wait until there's an injury, you know, and and, and we just sort of go on into cruise, right? We just put it in cruise control, set it, and forget it, and then like oh, when they get hurt, we'll do something yeah. about it instead of constantly checking in. I mean, I'm, we're talking in pro sport, we're talking in an access. Uh, an, ac- an accessible area where uh, me as a trainer, myself as a trainer or a therapist or a strength coach has access to you on a daily basis. So um, I always talk to other therapists about being on the gym floor, being on the sidelines, being as active a- as possible in your athletes' lives because that's where you're going to gain the most information. When you come in and you have a hurt back, sure, you're going to get information. But by that point, like, how do you know what you're basing recovery off of? What are you going to change that, that Marcus has been doing all this time that may be a contributing factor to that as well? And then you talk on the next point of trying to get back to those routines again. Um, and, and we're such creatures of habit that it's almost like if I play baseball, I need to be able to deadlift. I need to be able to sprint. I need to be able to do these workouts on a regular basis. And again, you talk about the mental approach to, to hitting. I would say that that internal cue as an athlete becomes that much more important to understand what feels good, what feels right, and what doesn't. Not just what's on the sheet of paper or on your phone in terms of what your workout says you're supposed to do today, but how do you feel today? And then, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of great practitioners out there that do a daily kind of check-in in pro sport. And I think it's becoming more of a thing um, in baseball now to sort of have you know individualized programs within the, the global program, which I think is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and and the teams are a little bit greater, but you also touched on, on trainers and strength coaches being, um, high impact with you. So I I think that's a great lesson for everybody listening as well. That is a practitioner or is going to be a practitioner that every conversation that we have potentially impacts the outcome, right? With you as an athlete, because if we don't know what we're talking about and we're just feeding you information that we read off somebody's Instagram post and you're believing that to be truth we we end up in a in a pretty uh, unsustainable cycle of of recovery or or solid training right so good information is always good information and every conversation matters when we're having it with athletes so those are you bring up some really good stuff that that sometimes you know i haven't even thought about in in you know uh, a year or so or a couple years and, and and it really brings it back around to like how do we really connect and that's uh, a good pun with your name. I just like saying your name all the time. So I just say connect all the time, but, um, how do we connect with our athletes? And, and we do that by knowing who's in front of us and, and, uh, I think tapping into who they are. Right. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah. Yeah. I would say, I mean, I, I, I trusted, I mean, the trust factor is a big, is big man, you know, cause you really, you really want to play every day and you want to stay on the field. Right. And at the same time you're hurting and you don't really want to tell anybody that you're hurting. So it's, it's kind of a tough, it's a tough position to be put in for both, both people. Right. Me, you know, a guy like me and say, and say you, if I was to come at, come at you, 
saying like, look, I'm hurting, but I do not want to go out of this game. Don't tell coach. And then, you know, that happens all the time, man. That's a lot of athletes would rather, would rather not say anything, Yep. you know, and that's, that's the sad part. That's sad because, you know, that, that affects performance. And uh, then you're just hiding, hiding things. And, you know, if it lowers performance, you know, find another way, find a way around it, bring it out in the open and, and, and fix it. Yep. Transparency and communication. Great, great topic, great talking points, great topics and, and, uh, and, and really central to, to every facet of life. Right. And, uh, you bring one up about trust and I was reading something today and I was like, Marcus is coming on tonight. I, it, there just seems to be this good timing when I'm bringing people on like you. And, and I took a picture of what I was reading. So I was going to read it out. And, uh, as strength and conditioning legend and coach Johnny Parker states, I coach people, not weights. What I've learned in 27 years of doing this is that athletes want somebody who cares and somebody who can help them improve. They won't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I just thought that was like, that was boom. That was it. If I could put that on a quote in the back of a t-shirt, I will just repeat that every day and have everybody who's walking behind me read it as well, right? So if you know I care, really, you, you ultimately, we have a bond and the outcome is going to be greater because you know I care. I know you obviously care because you're here to try and get better and try to make it to the big leagues or whatever it is that you're doing. Your big leagues could be a desk. Your big leagues could be picking your kids up 10 years from now. Whatever the case might be, um, once we garner that trust, it's a two-way street because I don't gain your trust until you've gained mine, you know? So it goes both ways. And I think that's massive. And, and that care factor, that TLC factor, uh, I could be putting baby powder on your shoulder, but if you and I have a good solid relationship, that baby powder could be just what you need to feel right to go get, you know, a couple knocks that night to bring you out of a slump or, or whatever it might be, you know, in, in your world or, or in the performance world, regardless of, of situation. So, um, you touch on some really good that's things. True. It's always amazing to hear athletes speak about their experiences and, and, um, and then relate it back to what we do and what we hear. And, and, and when I say we, I can only, you know, my own historical experiences and my own biases. But like, uh, if, I've, if I'm hearing what you're saying on a regular basis, then I can program for you a whole lot better too. You know, I, you don't necessarily have to deadlift. You might be the person who, who needs to stagger your stance when you deadlift and use a kettlebell or, or, you know, we might need to vary things just based on how you're feeling today, how you're feeling yesterday. But, uh, w- w- again, it comes yeah. back to communicating and, and all of these things that are crucial to, to, um, our profession as athletic therapists, athletic trainers, and, and your profession as a, as an athlete and a human being, you know, when it comes to performance. So, so you're coaching now, you're back in the Toronto area. You and I have had the opportunity to, uh, to play catch, um, to sit on top of a, a hill and have some conversations about aligning some things. Um, yeah. Uh, where, where are you looking to go in terms of coaching? Do you want to just continue with the amateur levels? Do you want to keep coaching or, or immediately, uh, you're just focused on now and helping as many people as you can where yet? Yeah, I'm focused on, I'm focused on primarily giving back and, and, um, all age groups and offering, you know, offering my techniques and offering my programs to, to teams and, and, private athletes, things like that. Um, I mean, as a pro, believe it or not, man, I didn't really, I didn't really do many private lessons at all. I didn't do, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't really, that wasn't really in my scope of things to do was, was to give back, you know? And so now that's, that's what I'm focusing on. Yeah. And it's basically, a gr- it's a great area <laughs> and there are, get a little feedback. Sorry. Uh, it's a great area and there's a lot of people that are really going to benefit from, from talking to you, just having you around the field, having you around coaches and parents and, and, uh, yeah. um, all of those things. Cause there's a lot to be gained from, from just, you know, having those chats with you and, and, um, and getting to know you uh, a little bit more outside of the diamond for me has been great. I mean, we've had a few conversations. I look forward to many more again with you moving forward here. Um, but you also had your career sort of like, you know, you and I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago and I brought it up on here with a couple, you know, during a couple of the chats, because when we met, you, you sort of had started talking about um, how long you spent working on your swing and becoming a baseball player and becoming a, a pro and getting to the, the highest level possible that you kind of lost yourself in all of that. 
right? You're perfecting the physical, the physical, the physical. Um, and this idea, like you said, you just didn't know until you stepped away because you're so immersed in it that you didn't have uh, the opportunity to sort of step out and gain right. some perspective. Um, so you mentioned sort of now you're starting to find yourself. You're, you're really spending some care and some time to, to work on yourself. What does that entail for you? And, and if you could have, I mean, there's, there's probably going to be a few athletes that listen in here and in the future, definitely. Um, what would you advise if you could go back in time and work on yourself during those times? What do you think you would do or how would you advise yourself? Hmm. Yeah, like you kind of you nailed it. What, what we were talking about was I spent so much time on the physical. So much time on the physical. And, you know, I realized – not too long ago, a couple of years ago, when I had this kind of this, this revelation that it's more about what, you know, the value that you bring to the community and the value, like, how can you use, how can you use your position and your, you know, your status, say, to, to, um, to, to bring positivity? Maybe that's not the right word I'm looking for, but like, um, like, like goodness to, to the community around you, right? And instead, I was, instead I was focused on, on me and how I was going to do and how I was going to do this and how I was going to do that, you know? And so I kind of, if I was going to go back, I would say, I would say take a lot of pressure off myself, take a lot of um, focus off of myself, you know, like thoughts of thoughts of the ego thoughts of where, where I wanted to be, where I wanted to go and put them on to, you know, how can I, how can I make the world a better place? <laughs> it's, you know? be it's beautifully said, man. And, and reducing that, uh, that self-serving nature is, is, I mean, it's human condition, right? To, 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 to focus within ourselves and on ourselves. Um, but you talk mm. about that and, and, and just adding goodness and positivity and, and being part of something bigger than, than you. And once you gain that, you, you gain uh, a whole lot more access to yourself and so many other things. So um, I'll thank you for, for sharing that with us all on here and, and into the future. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of people that have questions with that, um, you know, athletes and some other things. And I'd love to open you up as a channel for other athletes that are dealing with COVID right now, because it's not a, it's not a dissimilar situation to lose a season, to lose uh, a career because, you know, the college season or the university season got canceled and it was my last one, or I was coming off a of surgery and I was going to be ready, but I, I, now I don't get to, you know, so, um, I think a lot of people can relate to, to your story and your experience. So, um, it's, it's amazing that you would share yeah. it. And, uh, and, and I think there's plenty more of that in the future as well. If, if you're, uh, up for that, I know you are, we've talked about it and, and there's a lot of people out there that would love yeah. to your brain. Um, after being a couple of questions just rolled in here, after being in the pros with all the player support you mentioned, uh, how was it to transition into the IBL, uh, the inter-county baseball league where there isn't as much direct contact with support staff and, uh, how did your routine change? Uh, actually we had a great, we had a great therapist. Like I played for the Maple Toronto Maple Leafs who, you know, they're kind of like the central, I guess the central team to the league. And, um, we actually had a great therapist, you know, we got along very well. I needed him badly every game because, you know, just to get me, just to get me something, right. Get my, my T spine going. It was locked up or get my hips, you know, from driving two hours to the game. And there's a lot of things you still need. And uh, the first year I actually played in the IBL, I, um, I, I hurt my back and I just, I was out of camp. I was at this, this volunteer camp. Um, just down by the lake shore, and I bent over to pick up a ball, and it, just like that, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't really raise my back back up, and that ended my season. But the next year, I came back, pretty much full, but my first healthy season uh, in, in like three or four years. So that was amazing. The, the transition was was really good. Um, I just, just ever since I had that that revelation of uh, of you know. The, the mental side drives the physical side and, and how to how to have a process each pitch each game that helps you get to your your best you know your best hitter your best person and it's once I had that process then I could start working on that process and that really that really elevated my uh, my love and joy for for hitting in the game once I started to really just dial in on on that process and uh you know, I, I'd want to play another eight years, 10 years, just focusing on that process that helps me get to that place. 
just to refine it and, and, and get it better. So like, I love, I love hitting. I love baseball more than I ever did more than I ever have right now. Funny enough. Um, so I love, I love the transition and, and the IBL. I really enjoyed everything but the travel, everything but uh, driving in the traffic. <laughs> Basically. I love the, like, the fans are great. And uh, I hope to play in that league, you know, for many more years. Yeah, man, and we wish you the best with that as well. I hope you do, and uh, and you got somebody just around the corner now that can uh, wrench a good shoulder when you need it. So just give me a call. We'll make sure that happens. Uh, I, I, I think I think <laughs> I think you had an athletic therapist uh, with Toronto, right? Was that was that uh, Aaron? Was Aaron with you? Is that who it was? Do you remember his name? Yeah, there's a guy named pa- a guy named Pedro. Oh, guy named Pedro. Pedro. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, well, you know Pedro? No, I, I don't know. Maybe I don't remember, but we'll, we can figure that out. I'll go back through the through the records and see if we know if I know who it is. Um, but th- there are some therapists um, scattered throughout the uh, the Inner County Baseball League, um, and not many in the amateur ranks, right? So uh, we go down into some of the minor uh, baseball, and there's not many people that are there. I'm not saying that we have to be on benches, but do you see uh, a fit for sort of that model? that's in minor league baseball to spill over into amateur sport? You think there would be some benefit for those, maybe not the eight and 10 year olds, but the 12 to 16 to 18 year olds where the educational part can really become housed within uh, amateur baseball. You feel like that might be. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, if they think about it, if they have somebody that they trust, you know, that, that they have access to, right. Then they wouldn't have to spend all the time, you know, do, doing the, the research themselves, they'd have that's the, the beauty of having somebody you trust with information, right? Is that you can go to them, you know, to, to learn and it, it can really, really accelerate uh, development. I, I think, I think it's a really good idea considering how much, how serious parents take it as well in terms of take performance, right. And how much putting the kid on a, on a schedule throwing program and whether he's throwing too much or, you know, it's good to have, it's good to have a pro. It, w- it would be good to have a pro um, yeah. to, to to monitor that for sure. Yeah, no, see that. that. That's awesome, and to have your feedback, it kind of bolsters uh, our role as athletic therapists or uh, our scope of practice and, and where we feel like you know we can take this. In the amateur level, sometimes it's it's overlooked, but uh, at the same time, schedules are not getting any. I mean. In a, in a year that isn't COVID driven, um, uh, schedules aren't getting any slimmer. You know, things are getting packed and packed and packed and organizations are offering more and more and more and more showcases and more tournaments and more throwing and come throw with us because you'll start on uh, uh, December 26th or January 2nd, you can start throwing if you come to our organization. And, and there's a lot of misnomers yeah. and, mis- and misinformed um, information out there in terms of what's good for kids and what's not. And you've hit it on the head, eight years old. If you're going to do something, do it stealth. It can't be, it can't be hammered in to like sit here and, uh, and start really focusing on, on the mental approach when you're eight years old, but you do it through other drill work. You make it fun. You inform parents, you inform coaches. And I think that really houses, uh, something nice. So for all the therapists out there looking to make headway, I think again, um, it's been a common thread with all of our guests on here, um, that there's plenty of, there may not be jobs, but there's plenty of work out there for athletic therapists. If you're willing to take the initiative, work in a sport you're comfortable with or want to be in, um, and apply yourself on that field side, uh, even as an advisor, a consultant or, or directly on the bench, the dugout, this pool, pool deck, the sideline, the whatever in the arena, wherever the things are. So great opportunities out there and and to have somebody who's played for as long as you have, and now to be coaching with the amateur level support sort of that idea um, or that ideology goes a long way. So that's great, man. Um, Again, Marcus connect is our guest tonight on let's chat session 30 already an athletic therapy round table. Um, yeah, so Greg just wrote in, thanks, Marcus, for sharing. It's important for therapists and conditioning coaches to hear the impact they can have on athletes as mentors and performance improvement. So that goes a long way, too. Greg Greg is a, a colleague and, and a mentor as well and, and a friend, and, and uh, those are massive things to hear. It supports everything that we do so that we can – it also enhances, you know, our oh, yeah. drive and our access. So it is really, really important that we hear it um, from you as well because we sometimes don't ask, and, and it's two ways, right? So – yeah, that's fantastic that that uh, yeah, 
share all that with us. If anybody else has anything yeah. for, for Marcus, please feel free to, to chime in, throw something into the, the chat box, anything. Um, I know there's a couple collegiate, uh, collegiate university level therapists on here and they're dealing with, uh, with COVID and a semi return to return to sport or at least the loss of seasons and stuff and, and what that's going to look like. So if there's anything, please feel free. Otherwise we'll just keep going here. I lost the, um, I didn't lose it, but I kind of missed a couple sessions. I've been asking everybody if they watch Tiger King and I know it's old now and outplayed, but I'm just going to ask you if you watch Tiger King during COVID, did you watch it or no? Nobody. Not yeah, even thanks. close. All right. All right, perfect. Not even close. I thought about it, but yeah. I couldn't do it. I couldn't yeah. do it, man. Couldn't yeah. do it. So many other things you Too could much, be doing. Dude. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a fair answer. I think that <laughs> I think that's uh, it's open and honest, and I respect that. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but I'm just saying I respect your uh, yeah. your opinion on that one. Um, anything you picked up during these times, other than like some more of a, a heavier mental game in terms of approach and stuff like that? You picked up anything new during these COVID times in terms of uh, I don't know hobbies or coffee drinking or anything coffee drinking um well, i mean I, I always like coffee yeah. started drinking a little extra french french press uh, coffee yeah okay yeah. well done I'll, I'll, you just keep you it's, just keep uh, yeah, improving three, three months of covid that's what i did yeah yeah Perfect. Well, uh, I know that you sort of started entering that amateur realm, amateur space as well, a little bit heavier of late. And, uh, and we have some common, um, some common colleagues that are, uh, are really right alongside you, um, supporting you with this. And, and, uh, I'd love to be right alongside you too, supporting you in this role. Cause I think it's a, it's a great role for you. Um, you share your passion of the game just, just by playing a game of catch, you know, and, uh, and you share your knowledge and your, uh, all of your experience and that goes so far for so many people so everybody's lucky to have you all thank you on their behalf and I also want to thank you for not just for being here tonight but for for impacting my life uh, both in Lansing and and beyond and and as we move into the future man so really appreciate uh, appreciate you really I do and um and for being on tonight it's been it's been a great talk and uh it's been over an hour so I'll let you go I sort of I'd say, I told you I'd keep it around an hour and great. uh just thank you for your time, man. It's been great. What a great chat. And if, if anybody's willing, uh, if anybody wants to reach out, um, are you okay if I pass along your, your contact information? Of course, man. Of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. All right. I appreciate you as well. I mean, I appreciate everybody who, uh, everybody who listened and, um, and collaborated and I appreciate it, man. So I, I uh, hope you guys have a great night. <laughs> yeah, 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 the awkward ending. Yeah, yeah, man. Let's let's do it. Let's go for a French press coffee here in the next couple of days, and uh, and we'll get caught up on this one. I'm sure lots of people will be reaching out to me to connect to you as well. So, um, uh, yeah, Marcus course. Connect, Marcus Connect has been our guest tonight. Let's chat session thirty. Really appreciate your time, man. And for everybody who made it out here this evening, thank you so much for your time. Everybody's picking this up on the YouTube channel. Keep telling your friends. Keep growing the profession. Keep networking. Keep growing. Keep learning. All right. Wish y'all a good night. Thank you so much.